the education panel today here is to elaborate a little bit about how these individuals from different institutions share how their Latin, um, Latinx heritage has been the catalyst for the way that they approach teaching and their creative practice. So there's gonna be a lot of beautiful insights that is gonna be good for both established designers and you know junior designers or students. So this is gonna be amazing. When it comes to education, one thing that is critical to know, education has always had this relationship with empowerment. Education is all about uplifting people and providing the set of skills and, and, and knowledge necessary to achieve certain things, but that's the utilitarian aspect to it. There's also the humanitarian aspect and the, the process of community building, which is bringing people in an environment where they can share ideas and find common ground or actually debate certain situations, right? With level of respect. But at the end of the day, this is all about creating new layers for people to stay, step on and continue moving towards their goal. And that is the core principle of empowerment. So for us, education, especially in the next community and the Hispanic community, it's all about creating this value of understanding how knowing things can get you to better places and how you can become a person that can bring more impact whether it's your community or society so i believe this is the best correlation that we can create i think to inform the value of education and empowerment um, now coming to our moderator um, i know you guys love seeing my face but this is not about me so i would like to start introducing our moderator which is natasha Poggio. like i mentioned from AAGA Houston. Natasha is an, a, a design educator and TEDx speaker and an advocate for design for social change. In her teachings at the University of Houston Dynamo, she concentrates, concentrates in the role of the nature plays in our lives and encourages students to find solutions that will inspire positive change in society. As the founder of, of Design Global Change, Natasha focuses on designing human-centered solutions to address problems in global health sustainability and social justice. Her work has reached hundreds of communities in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and has garnered enough recognition. Most notably, uh, she's a two-time recipient of the SAPI Ideas Matter Awards. So for your ado, I would love to introduce to you guys, Natasha Polio. Hi everyone, can you see me? Yes, okay, now, now I can see myself. <laughs> Thank you, Julio, for that introduction. Um, so I am very excited uh, to do this session with you all today uh, because uh, I, when I joined UNIDOS team to work on this uh, five-week collaboration of an efforts, uh, multi-chapter effort, uh, I thought that education had to have a very important aspect and uh, we have a student panel and now we are like almost closing the, the sessions, the talks with an education panel. As an educator, education is a very, um, it's a subject very, very important to me. Um, and I, I reach out to educators that I knew before and new educators that I was not aware um, because I wanted to bring diverse perspective. And one of the things that I noticed is that I need to know and I need to learn more about other educators. Like my, my uh, world of education has been very small. Um, let me say this back. My world of education has been very big. I know a lot of people in education. I just don't know as many who are Latin or Hispanic. And that was a big uh, eye-opening um, uh, opportunity for me to like reach out to new uh, people and some of those new people are with us today. So I'm very excited about introducing you to uh, Omar Sosa Sek, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. I hope that Omar forgives me if I didn't pronounce that. Um, so let's see, Julio, uh, can you advance? Yes, thank you. So uh, Dr. Omar Sosa Sek is Assistant Professor of Design Foundations at uh, San Francisco State University in California. His research is concerned with the semiotics, rhetoric, and aesthetics of a phenomenon called design delight. His practice centers uh, on information design. Um, he's passionate about interfaces, symbols, diagrams, colors, typography, 
and flavors. Mm. Uh, Omar has taught at undergrad and graduate programs across uh, the United States and uh, in Mexico. And I'm so delighted to invite him today to talk um, and share with us what he does in, in the practice and education as a Latinx. Thank you, Natasha. Um, I'll try to share my screen now, if that's fine. Yes. Okay, awesome. So I think um, the host needs to stop sharing the screen, if I got it right, so I can share mine. Perfect. Um, so, hi everyone, hola. Um, my name is Omar Sosatsek, and um, I'm delighted to participate in this panel. And I wanna thank Natasha for the invitation. And I wanna give a big shout to uh, AIGA Unidos for organizing this event and giving visibility to the Latinx creative community. Um, I wanna start by saying that delight is a powerful emotion. Um, it affects how we perceive and remember um, daily experiences. And in the context of design, um, it plays a, a persuasive role of the user experience. That's what I want to encourage designers to recognize the impact of delightful design and use it for good, especially to help people live a good life. And as we know, many of these, you know, delightful moments, they come from the forms, shapes, colors, textures, and flavors of these everyday experiences. It's basically the designed world we live in and we help to build. Well, I was born in Merida, Yucatan, Mexico, and I am Yucatecan and I'm a mestizo with Mayan heritage. And I live a big portion of my life in Yucatan. And even though I lived in other cities in the Mexican Republic, I think the, my Yucatecan identity is a big part of me and it um, has a deep influence of how I think of and do delight um, and do design, sorry, and like think of delight and pursue delight. Well, I grew up in a place that echoes, you know, this Asian, mystical culture. And I believe that being exposed to design elements of the Mayan culture, you know, like made me, you know, appreciate things that are, you know, like um, permanent and solid and, and also rich in symbolism, textures and colors. But, you know, the Yucatecan culture is something that is alive and vivid is something that you know we can experience nowadays. It's not only about the Asian Mayan culture. And a key word that I want us um, to consider here is syncretism. I believe that syncretism became a lens, you know, for me to conceive, you know, um, this notion of design delight. As we can see here, this is an example of how um, the cross stitch adapted in the Yucatecan culture and now is known as in the Mayan word is um, shock pichui. And it's like so vivid, so um, rich, you know, and, and to me, it makes me feel really delight and feel passion and feel this pride, you know, about being born in Yucatan. And it's not only about like things that we use, you know, the utilitarian things. It's also about, you know, like how this syncretism, you know, is now present, you know, in the flavors of Yucatan. Like we have this combination of the Spanish culture with the Mayan culture and other cultures around the world that like give us now this amazing gastronomy. So in short, you know, all these textures, all these colors, all these ideas of like an Asian mystical past and, you know, and the vividness and richness and particularities of this region, you know, they really, they really affected the way I think of design and I do design and how it connects to my research, how I um, think of this notion design delight, which I express um, through several qualities, including engagement, liveliness, cuteness, serendipity, um, reassurance, and captivation. 
Um, and these qualities um, are also part, you know, of my design pedagogy, and they have influenced, you know, how I work with students. Because I believe that delightful design can be an instrument to raise awareness. For example, here I have a, a, my students create a series of posters um, to raise awareness about consent and like, you know, making women feel safe on campus. I believe that delightful design can be an instrument to build communication channels and also to create connections between people. Like in this case, my student created um, this companion for a child to communicate um, his emotions to his parents. He, um, the kid is supposed to add a little colorful bean in the mouth of this little monster and the parent then later can come and see what emotions the kid experienced that day. Because I believe that delightful design, you know, can be an instrument to imagine an interesting future. Like in this case, my student, you know, like proposed this speculative design of this mask that will tell you about the internal and external levels of pollution. And in that way, you know how to take care of yourself and your environment. So I wonder, you know, how does the light, you know, affect your life? Gracias. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Omar. This was Thank like you. delightful. Like the word delightful, exactly. <laughs> uh, and the food just make me so hungry. Um, thank you so much. I look forward to like chatting later about your your work. Um, so moving on, um, next uh, speaker is Elio Leturia. So Elio is an associate professor of journalism at Columbia College, Chicago. Uh, originally from Peru, as a bilingual journalist, he constantly shifts between English and his native Spanish. Um, he pairs uh, stories with the perfect image of layout and typography. His design work has been recognized by the Society of News Design, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, the American Institute of Graphic Arts, and the Associated Church Press. He's the communication director of the Chicago chapter of the Fulbright Association and also an ensemble member of Aguijón Theater Company of Chicago. Welcome, Elio. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me today. And I want to tell you my story, which is starts in 1994 when I moved from my native Peru to Chicago when I am hired by the Tribune Company. After Elio, don't forget to share your screen. I did, okay, let me just one second. There we go. Already, you can see it now, full, full yes. frame, right? Okay, great. So that's me and I am um, having a transition between what you see on the left side, which is the downtown uh, plaza in Lima that was uh, funded in 1535 and my transition to Chicago, which is on the right side. Um, when I moved to the United States, relocated by the Tribune Company, and then I moved to the Detroit Free Press in, what, in which what I call the English Press, I noticed that there was not enough coverage of Latinos. And being a journalist and a graphic designer, I have always combined those two fields so I can produce written and visual content. But now the, um, the challenge was to do it in English. And what I, what I did is I started um, pitching story ideas, but of course what was going to happen is that, you know, English is, my, is not my native language and I speak with an accent. So it took a little convincing to uh, the editors. So the first thing that I started doing were uh, music reviews, uh, opinion columns and restaurant reviews where were more, you know, shorter, shorter pieces but I always volunteer to take the content of Latino oriented issues and bring them to light. So uh, in this illustration from 2002, which is when uh, Salma Hayek 
presents the, her movie Frida, and the, the film critic travels to uh, Toronto to interview her. So this is an illustration that shows how she brings Frida to life. Here is when in Detroit, all these products of Latino origin were coming to the market and uh, what a way to do it than using Carmen Miranda and her famous uh, hat with all the fruits, but instead of coming, of coming up fruit is typography with all the names of these new products. In this case, this is a page that I, I wrote this, this story and uh, designed it as well. And I was very happy to win the best uh, design of the year from the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. So it's a trivia of different questions about Latino culture. You can see that I am showing masks that they are in the corner that represented different ethnic groups because you know, in Latin America, we are all a melange. Here uh, we have um, a package on um, the Latino cocktails and I have the piña colada, the pisco sour, pisco sour from Peru, mojito, caipirinha and margarita. Here we have a story on Barcelona where I traveled to report and took the pictures and also when I came back I designed the page for the travel section. Um, these two uh, packages are about Mexican food. In the first one, I wrote um, a review of 10 taquerias and I did it all in one day. And the second one is a story on a Mexican restaurant, but it's not on the restaurant, but the people who work at the restaurant that, can, that came from different countries, Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. And I found that really interesting to report. This is another trivia about Latino food for Hispanic Heritage Month. All these dishes that you see there, are, come from Latin America and we have questions like who invented the Caesar salad? It was in Mexico in 1924 in Tijuana. The, then uh, I moved to, to, to Chicago to work for Columbia College so I go back to writing and the Tribune has two papers one in Spanish and one in English and then I, I started writing for the two of them as a freelancer and then they asked me for photography and I was able to design as well so you can see the, on the right side, the layout of this uh, show. Um, this is Aguijón Theater posters for the different um, shows that they have. Aguijón Theater is the oldest Latino company in Chicago. It's 31 years old. You can see the first poster that I did, that's me in the photo, and the last poster that you see on the right, that's also me uh, and, on, on the photo uh, for another play. I um, work for the Huffington Post where I talk about Latino issues and I also illustrate these stories. This is a film that I did, a documentary on the life of this uh, woman who was born in Spain, then moved to Argentina and when she was 76, she moved to Chicago and she became a citizen uh, when she turned 102 years old. That won the um, Lisa Gore Award for the best short film documentary. This is a series of posters in which I am having a fun critique about how the media uses the Spanish language and though they don't use at St. Mark's or they deal this on top of the Enes or they use the articles in the wrong way. So instead of Pedro is 24 years old, that says Pedro has 24 anuses, which you don't want to really say. This is the two posters that I did this year about two um, Spanish um, artists who came to Columbia College, one a filmmaker and the other a musician to present their work. And this is a book that I had last year published uh, that I wrote, uh, I co-edited and I designed the 146 pages and also worked in the sun photography. And that was my largest project in which I put together all the skills that I have in both languages. And that's it. That's my email address if you would like to contact me. Thank you very much for the invitation. Great, thank you so much, Elio. That was great. Uh, I know that, I know there has been like, you know, more comments about food on the chat. Uh, like you're all making us hungry and like I love the illustrations and those uh, plates that you uh, feature, very beautiful. So our next speaker is Matias Ferrari.
And uh, if Julio can advance the next slide. Great, thank you. Matias, he says that he's a designer living in Sin. Um, he stopped having fun with his Wacom tablet and he, and he won seat and started a love affair with Python and data science. He has designed for about 15 years and started as many first in a small agency, then larger one, and then to a company as a head designer. In 2015, he got his MFA in visual communication design while researching about type, perce perception, and political des design campaigns. While doing so, he also taught for the first time and changed his whole career path. Now he teaches and works in one of the best design schools in Chile and is studying a master in data science. Um, he's at the Universidad del Desarrollo in Chile. Welcome, Matias. Thank you, Natasha. So let me just click here to share my screen and uh, we'll begin. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, good. So, hola a todos. My name is Matias and uh, I'm a designer and a faculty in the design school at Universidad del Desarrollo down down, down, down south, down there in Chile, that little dot there. And um, I wanted to disclose before the presentation that I don't see myself as an authorship designer. And I mean this in a good way, but trying to explain that I'm not gonna show my, pro my professional work because uh, it doesn't say anything about me particularly. So, or, or not that I'm conscious about. So I think that I'm making a showcase of my work here would be a little pointless. And uh, what I feel it's, it's going to be far more interesting and, and that will help you to understand my work is to discuss why I design and also who I am. So everything I design and most of what I teach fits in different forms under this sort of manifesto uh, that I see design as an agent for the democratization of knowledge and provocation of both rational and emotional responses. And this, because I truly believe that only through knowledge and empowerment, people and societies will unite in action towards the creation of a sustainable future. This research I did about typefaces while I was pursuing my MFA at Purdue University was about understanding the nonverbal attributes of, type, of typefaces in the context of presidential campaigns. Regardless of the topic and the research itself, um, because it will take too long to explain here, I wanted to talk about the experience of putting this poster in the middle of a graduate research poster exhibition at Purdue University, where of course I was the only designer among hundreds of graduate students in biology, chemistry, physics, computer science, among other programs. And when presenting my poster to the different people that were drawn to it, the most common comments were things like, thank you, it is so easy to follow, or we need more of you in science, or I don't have to read your poster. I look at it and I get it and I understand where you're going. And I'm not sure if you've been in, in any of these research poster exhibitions, but yes, science posters are quite different from these ones. You have to read a lot. You have to spend some time understanding a couple of charts. And if you're not familiar with the topic or the language, the technical language, I mean, it is also very likely that you will still be clueless after reading. So that very idea of making complex information digestible was, a, was very enlightening to me. Today, in the age of data, I believe design has a beautiful challenge. We, the people, are producing data with every, every breath we take, and companies are using that information to their profit. And I'm not really against that. However, I firmly believe that the chain should not stop there. Thus, what I'm thinking now is how we, designers could offer organizations ways in which that knowledge and insights that they, that they produce about people can be returned to people in a meaningful, in a meaningful way, right? So uh, this is the reason why I'm studying my, sep my second graduate program, a master's in data science, and spending most of, most of my time making sense of Excel files, databases, statistics, and algebra, coding in Python and using that little terminal thing that we have in the Mac OS and that designers hardly ever use. For instance, as part of my position in, in Universidad del Desarrollo, in addition to teaching, I do have to analyze a lot of complex information about students, demographic information, um, uh, admission data, grade records, attendance, et cetera, et cetera. And I have to make sense of this 
uh, and we use this information to evaluate our program, to improve it, and to comply with both institutional and governmental paperwork. However, while I'm doing this, I'm learning a great deal about our students. And, and I'm learning things about them that maybe not even then are not even they are conscious about. And, and thus, I'm trying to find ways in, into packaging this information and give it back to them in a meaningful way for them to improve uh, their learning process, among other possibilities. So here you see a project in which I tried to map, uh, this is a, an ongoing project, I started it a couple of weeks ago, and I'm trying to map the relationship that students make when they encounter themselves within the classroom. So you can see these little dots, there are students in the first year, here on the right side, and in the left side, you see students that move into the senior years, right? And the bigger the circle is, is because the, they have made or they have contacted more students within the classrooms. And this image is, is very, I think is very, um, is very relevant today, especially in the context of coronavirus, because many people are trying to question the value of universities here in, in Santiago, in Chile. And because they're trying, they're saying that the online programs can, can give you the same, but online programs like those you learn in, in these uh, asynchronous portals, uh, they cannot give you probably this instance of teamwork, of getting, to, getting in touch with other people the same way you do in the classroom. So that's what I really like about this uh, visual here. And there is the who I am part. I am a Latin American, right? And, and one of the traits that I think Latin we Latin Americans have is that we are very natural at, at establishing strong relationships. We don't just say hello we want, when we walk into a place, we kiss and we hug, even when we don't know each other. And, and this is not a superficial fact, because by doing so, we're beginning to care about the, pe the person that we're kissing or hugging. We are creating a deeper bond, and we consider that person not just an acquaintance, uh, but a friend. And this influences how I relate to my work, to my clients, to my peers, and to my students. Uh, this because <clears throat> when, when I create this deeper connection, I'm, I feel like all of these parts are becoming some sort of distant cousin. So I force myself to stay in touch, I guess. And I, and I feel that I'm forced, I'm, I'm being drawn to stay connected and to care about where, what are they doing, how are they doing, and how are, how are they in, in, any, in any given day. And that deep concern or that deep care took me to uh, taking this conversation to the, to the teaching area. Uh, it, to, it, it drove me to really uh, consider that students in their first year in our program were feeling very anxious and very depressed because the, the experience they were expecting for their university life wasn't met because of the coronavirus. They were at home, they were not partying, they were not connecting with new people, they were, they were not feeling or living the university life they, that they wanted to. So I considered this and, and, and also they were a little bored of the regular video conference class. So we took our classes to the kitchen. So we don't have kitchens in the university, but students have kitchen at their home. And we did a, a very good process of uh, understanding uh, a technique of dyeing with sustainable inks. So they have to create a sustainable dye for textiles. With, uh, um, with the rest of vegetables and fruits. And they did a wonderful exploration. They got all these beautiful colors to create uh, a, a, a very planned and researched um, pattern and color compositions. And here you can see some of the results in which uh, they had to produce a, a five by five color composition. But then you also see the student in the right that took the project to a whole new level creating a, a wearable for herself uh, by using this very technique. So it was a very success, successful project in which they, they went through a very deep exploration, uh, investigation, they had fun in the kitchen. We met their kitchens and also we were talking about sustainability, we were talking about heritage in terms of the colors that we, they were using and how the, the, the uh, historical cultures within our uh, territory were using the pigments to dye their clothes, their textiles and the, their techniques. So yeah, I think that deeper connection that we Latin establish with people is very important to, and, and it manifests in, in everything I do, design-wise and relationship-wise. So thank you. And I think I went a little over my six minutes, but I did the best possible.
Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Matthias, again. Sometimes I'm not sure if my, my voice appears next to my video or not. Um, so I would like to introduce Melanie Uribe. She's a Venezuelan designer and assistant professor at Southern Connecticut State University. Her curiosity and excitement about the power of the language of graphic design drives her research on exploring the notion of exhibition space as a medium that facilitates effective communication, information flow, and the sharing of narratives that are both personal and universal about the complicated experiences of immigrants, voluntary or involuntary. Welcome, Melanie. Okay, it's giving me a message. I can't share my screen while other participating is sharing. I think you are able to share now. Okay. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> One second. Okay, for some reason it's making me restart my presentation. Sorry, to... really late. <laughs> Do you want me to share it and I advance the slides? Uh, sure, that, that'd be good too. So you, it's just restart the presentation or restart? The just presentation? restart the presentation. Oh, okay, maybe okay. it gets quicker. I'm trying again. No, nope, it's not letting me share. Te technical, technical things happen all the time. So let me um, open, I'm glad that I just downloaded. Um, so I just need to go and figure out where is my folder. So one second guys, this, is, this happens, <laughs> but we work with the issues. And I can find my downloads. Uh, and then I'll share, and you just tell me next or something, and okay, we we'll go from there. So, Melanie, here it is. All right, so I'll go to full screen first. And I'll ask for share screen. Okay, wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you, Natasha. Um, so my work is not as delightful or yummy as Elio's and Omar. <laughs> uh, but I am focusing on immigration and design. So not long ago, Venezuela was considered one of the wealthiest countries in Latin America. And today, Human Rights Watch estimates that 4.5 million Venezuelans are refugees scattered throughout the Americas and even Europe. So just a year and a half ago, that number was 2.3 million. So it almost doubled up in a matter of a year and a half. So currently my work is designed to visually articulate the personal narrative surrounding the struggle of moving and it's a significant of emotion to the debate of migrant identity, acculturation, and the perception of being the other, focusing on the current displacement crisis in Venezuela. You can go next, Natasha. So, uh, one of my most recent words, uh, it was an installation down in Florida, um, and I did a lot of research uh, on the crisis in, in Venezuela, and I did a lot of interviews. And I created a few pieces uh, on this exhibition that were a little bit more experimental and more interdisciplinary because I wanted to showcase how design can also be expressed in different types of forms than just a paper or a graphic. So in this case, I displayed a series of keywords that represented different aspects of the migration process and how people move across the borders. Uh, I used simple wood put it uh, on a horizontal shape on this wall and use lights and fixtures. So I had static lights and moving lights, and you can go to the next one, that's show. I had static lights and moving lights to represent this tension. 
So if you were looking at this wall from afar, you wouldn't see those messages, but as you got closer, you start seeing these shadows uh, created on the wall, which sort of represent the shadows that every people, every person that has migrated still have on them because these shadows don't ever really leave. And when the lights would turn on, they would create this static, almost as if you didn't want to be there. So they couldn't be on for too much um, because they could give you headaches and so on. Uh, but it was a very powerful entrance into the exhibition. Uh, then I created a lot of interviews. So I interviewed about um, 80 people. I started with just personal friends and acquaintances in Miami. And then it's sort of like word spread around and I started doing online interviews. And for everybody, I requested handwritten interviews because I wanted to represent each person in a bird. Now these birds were created out of paper, sort of like using paper mache style to give that sort of like fragile texture. And also half of the birds are showing outside of the wall to also represent this feeling like, you know, we're stuck in one place, but half of ourselves is in another. We can't really move on. Um, in this exhibit, there was also audio. So all the birds, the next, all the birds have the Spanish handwritten version in them, but the audio was translated in English. So people who come into this exhibition and actually call a phone number from their cell phones and listen to all of these stories. And the stories were, were deep from, I moved into this country and I've been in Boston uh, without papers for eight years, or I had to cross the border walking into Colombia and then made my way to Peru or all the way down to Chile. So it was a little bit heartbreaking to hear all about this. Um, and definitely even more eye-opening for me because I moved here by choice 20 years ago. So I haven't had to deal with any of these issues, but now I'm having family and friends that are going through all these troubles. Um, so, the birds was a very powerful piece and at the exhibition there were actually people crying so it was not my intention to make it that emotional but it, in one part of it I was glad to know that the emotion uh, went through the piece um you can go next uh i have another piece that i'll speak a little bit about so i don't go over my medicines uh, I took some extra time for the technical difficulties, but I actually created a piece specifically about my mother. Um, she didn't want to move here. Uh, she still doesn't want to be here, even though it's been about four or five years. Um, she was sort of like forced to stay by immigration. They were like, okay, you either need to stay here because you've been coming too so much or you need to leave and you won't be able to come back for 10 years. Um, so that was not really an option. Uh, I forced her to stay here and ended up requesting her. And this show sort of shows her journey over the past 10 years or so of going in and out uh, of the country. Um, because in Venezuela, you couldn't really make a living, but she still couldn't let go of her identity over there. So you can pass to the next one. As you can see, my work is um, a little bit more interdisciplinary. I try to stretch my design into different techniques. I love playing around with materials and I try to foster this into my classrooms. So in my classrooms, I try to create a community environment where student voices and opinions and ideas are valued. So I help them see each other as co-learners and have sort of like collaborative environment. Um, and I like to introduce different experiences and backgrounds in the materials. And I incorporate this with different assignments. Now I teach a very different area of classes from packaging to web to typography. Uh, and then a packaging project, I assign them to do a food uh, packaging. You can go to the next one, Natasha. And in this project, they have to interview each other uh, and learn about each other. And this project happened to be when I was teaching last year in Miami, which is a very diverse environment. And we have a wide range of cultures. So this way they could learn about their classmates, they could learn about their cultures that are not really familiar with, and start learning how to do research. Because this research is really going to help them develop 
their practice later on, whether it is social justice or even if it's advertising or marketing. Um, in my current university, I am teaching typography and experimental typography, and I wish I had the project that they're working on right now to show, uh, but unfortunately it's not finished. Uh, but my typography students are currently working on uh, posters and booklets for social issues. So I try to take away the marketing and the fun projects. They're gonna get that when they're working, right? Once they graduate, they're gonna work for fun brands and do posters and do things with music and alcohol and things like that. But in school, I really want them to start thinking. I really want them to start researching and figuring out what is important, what is happening around our world. And I do that with tech talks, with video chats, uh, they had a requirement to go to the activist panel two weeks ago. So actually that was a great one and I love their discussions. Um, so we can go to the next one. So overall, I think graphic design is everywhere. Every person unconsciously creates an opinion and makes choices on the basis of visual information. And often people do not think about the story behind the design. So in my work, I want to show that emotional experiences can be created via design through the use of narrative, along with an immersive multi-sensory environment, while providing information on history and culture. And hopefully, this motivates and inspires and prepares my students to be design leaders and active citizens in an increasingly diverse society. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. That was great. Thank you very much, Melanie. I love the shadow, uh, the shadow exhibition. It's, it's beautiful. Thank you. So um, now I'd like to introduce Elaine Lopez. She's a Cuban American designer, researcher, artist, and educator. Her work explores the intersection of cultural identity, equity, and diversity within the field of design. Through her practice, she creates new ways to share, honor, and, and celebrate the stories that have been neglected for too long due to white supremacy, patriarchy, and other forms of structural oppression. Elaine makes immersive graphic design experiences that challenges, challenge people to question and expand their worldview. She currently teaches graphic design at Maryland Institute College of Art as a recipient of the Akai Postgraduate uh, Teaching Fellowship, and I probably pronounced it wrong. Uh, Elaine, uh, I'm really excited to hear you talk because I didn't know Elaine before this panel and now I see her all over the place. So I'm excited to have um, the AGA Unidos family to learn about her work. Welcome Elaine. Thank you, Natasha. Hola a todos, gracias. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna talk very fast uh, because I put a lot of slides in, but don't worry, <laughs> they'll move quickly. Um, Okay, does that look okay? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, so thank you to all the previous presenters and for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, my name is Elaine Lopez, I use she, her pronouns, and my work is centered around making un underrepresented cultures more common. I grew up in Miami looking at these signs. Um, most strip malls around the US have this type of signage, but in Miami, they tell the story of the Latin American diaspora. I sometimes wonder if these influenced my decision to become a graphic designer. I was born in Miami in 1984 into a family of recently arrived Cuban exiles. From an early age, I noticed a difference between my life at home and what was represented on TV. In Miami-Dade public schools, I learned about Greek mythology and the American Revolution, but nothing about Cuba or Latin America, despite the fact that everybody around me was Hispanic. This made me feel ashamed of my culture because it didn't seem worthy of being taught in school. Uh, my experiences in the design industry as a Latina have had a profound influence on my desire to radically expand the ways we practice and teach design. One way I expand my practice is to share aspects of my Cuban heritage through my work. The first project I will share is an experimental publication called Bolita. For as long as I knew her, my grandmother watched El Noticiero to record the lottery numbers. This is one of the many notebooks she kept. I researched this behavior further and discovered that it wasn't just her. In Cuba, the lottery has had a long history tracing back to the migration, migration of workers from China in the 1800s. Here are some lottery tickets throughout the history of, of Cuban culture. 
Um, Cubans assign a meaning to each number to help translate their dreams and daily situations into numbers to play in the local lottery. The system is called La Charada, and it's really common among Cubans. If you happen to know any older Cuban people, you can ask them to tell you what any number between one and 100 means, and they're gonna give you a word like elefante or jicotea, and you're like, what? Um, so I was fascinated by this history, so I decided that I wanted to conduct more research by using the numbers and the words of La Charada as a guide. So since number one means horse, I Googled Cuba and horse and found this Wikipedia page. I then used that information to create signatures for a book. This one is for the number 16, and it's about how the Spanish brought bullfighting to Cuba in 1938. I then designed an interactive publishing game where the numbers you pick from the balls determine which page you get. So you start by picking up a ball like you would in the lottery, um, and then you would grab the corresponding page uh, based on the number on that ball. So for example, number four is cats. Uh, and when you research Cuba and cats, you learn about er Ernest Hemingway's cats with six toes. Number seven is caracol. And this page explains how the CIA tried assassinating Fidel Castro with an exploding seashell. Each page tells a fragment of Cuban history to represent how we learn about cultures through random bits and pieces of information. Admittedly, this is a complicated system to explain. It was hard to make this project without the feedback of a Cuban person, but it was important for me to stay true to this custom. I like sharing this project and all of its complexity because I believe it is important for students to dig deep into their experiences and cultures and make work about things that are complex, rich, and hard to explain. This is how we make these stories common. Another project inspired by my heritage is based on the game of dominoes. Normally, if we were live right now, I would ask people to raise their hands if they knew how to play dominoes, but I can't see your hands right now or your faces. Um, many people I've met outside of Miami think that this is how you play dominoes. I imagine that this crowd is maybe a little bit different. To me, dominoes has always looked like this. Uh, this is a place called Domino Park in Little Havana in Miami. Um, so keeping that in mind, I was inspired by Studio Moniker's project called Dazzle Fungus, which is a crowd, which are, are a series of crowdsourced installations which, which give participants the opportunity to collectively create an installation. This allows people to feel connected and engaged to the piece and to have a more active experience beyond being a spectator. So I created 55 nine by 17 inch sticker tiles out of vinyl and had people play the game of dominoes. So those who knew how to play the game uh, taught those who didn't know how to play the game and everybody worked together to install uh, the piece. These are from the first installation that I did at RISD. And these are from the second installation, which I did at MICA. Here are some of my student, students putting it together. Zuli and Zina, two of my students. Um, people who didn't know each other got to meet and interact in a different way. This was also just before COVID. So it gave the students one last time to work outside of the classroom in a physical space. This project is special to me because it allows, it allowed me to install an aspect of my culture uh, to invade this predominantly white institution, if only for a short period of time. I have also developed a class around the intersection of Rizzo printing, culture, and identity. I feel that Rizzo, is, which is a, I actually have one back here, it's a weird printer. Um, I feel that the Rizzo is the perfect machine to use when making work around culture because it is inherently joyful and easy to use, which are qualities that ease the burden of making work about difficult or painful topics. One of my students here, Zina, uh, used the Rizzo to explore ritual, iconography, and identity, and how the three have impacted her life as an Indian Ecuadorian. Ning Chen, uh, one of my students, says this about this piece. So, in China, we give meanings to common things and objects around us according to the pronunciations in Chinese. I selected some of these things which give good wishes to people. I Rizzoed them and hoped that they could bring people good luck. And finally, Akia Jones made a series of prints for Black History Month using iconic imagery from the civil rights movement. In conclusion, I believe that it is critical that we share our culture, our customs and ideas through design so that we may have a better understanding of the world around us and find the things that we share in common. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna end and I'm gonna stop sharing, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. That was great. And uh, 
I recently bought a Riso book and I love like the smell and the color so vibrant. It's wonderful. Awesome. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce the, the next speaker. She's a dear friend of mine. Uh, Cynthia Lozon Jaramillo is Associate Professor of Integrated Design and Dean of the School of Design Practices at Parsons School of Design. Uh, she's an, an, international, an internationally exhibited artist. Her research focuses on Parsons Deed Research Lab, which she co-founded in 2007 and currently directs. Um, the lab brings together students, faculty, and external partners from business, design, development, and policy to model more equitable ways for designers to work with artisans and for artisans to sustain their livelihoods. She has lectured internationally on design, education, technology, and social practice, including giving a TED TEDx talk on redesigning education. She's an active member of uh, design networks like AAGA and the Future of Design in Higher Education and also co-organizer of the annual conference Digitally Engaged Learning. Welcome, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Natasha. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm going to... We already know how it goes, right? Somebody says, I'm going to share my screen and then we all hold our breath and hope it works. Um, Okay, can you see that? Yes. Great. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, uh, Natasha. Thank you to Julio and Rachel, to all the organizers. It is so exciting to be speaking uh, in observance of Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, really delighted to be here. I think many of you who are tuning in uh, can, can relate to the complication uh, that stems when somebody says, where are you from? Especially when they then say, no, where are you really from? And uh, that for me, this is a photo from my preschool yearbook, was already um, complicating my identity there. Colombian, American, Guatemala City, Guatemala. These are the places of my mother's birth, my father's birth, and then my own. I was born in Guatemala. So you could perhaps say, well, she's American. Absolutely happy to claim American is my identity if we can acknowledge that America is our continent and not just the one country that is often labeled as such. And the dots that you see on the map are the places where I was born, where I grew up, where I started my design and social impact work, and where I am now. This is me with my sister and my mom uh, wearing Mayan uh, textiles, a huipil and a corte that my mother bought in Guatemala. And this is me a few years later in Bogota where I grew up and I wanted to have you see the, the textile that's framed on the wall. So I grew up in various places and the cultural uh, and, and, and diverse heritage uh, of my life and my family was always present by the material culture and the objects um, surrounding me and, and present uh, in the home. And fast forward uh, 35 years or so later, and I find myself with a group of students from Parsons School of Design in the Ixchel Museum in Guatemala City, now studying the, uh, the history and indigeneity, the material culture of these uh, woven Mayan, just absolutely gorgeous uh, textiles. My um, work in the last 10 years, both teaching and research, has been in this space around social impact, entrepreneurship, and design. And it really comes to life through the research lab that I co-founded and now run called the Deed Lab, where we're really exploring how uh, designers and designing relate to the artisan sector. And we're, we're, we're preoccupied with exploitation, and we want to celebrate uh, models that, that really approach uh, the problem of indigenous artisans and their futures in a very holistic way through these three lenses of poverty, empowerment, uh, and, and heritage. I believe that design can play an important role for both financial and environmental sustainability as long as it's not externalized. I am concerned by uh, community engagement that creates dependencies. And I've been very uh, excited to be able to take my students on uh, international fieldwork programs where I've really been able to observe what faculty and students can learn in communities uh, when we're not necessarily in a classroom in New York City. In 2008, we had the pleasure a team of faculty and students to, to live for a month in San Lucas Tolimán in, in Guatemala. And, um, we were really confronted and challenged by our own frameworks and, and, uh, and relationships to space, to time, 
And through the challenges of that, uh, it just really made apparent the privileges with which we had arrived to do the work. Uh, and, and it was just a, an amazing uh, transformational and learning experience for all of us. From a spatial uh, perspective, you know, we had arrived with the various passports that we have. We have the ability to, to arrive and leave. Uh, and yet the artisan association with whom we were working, most of the women and their children uh, don't know how to swim uh, and are raised to be fearful of the water. And in fact, um, to, to, to tell and share the stories and the mythologies of this magical lake, Lake Atitlan, uh, for some of you who may be familiar with it, surrounded by volcanoes. And so their sense of the world is quite uh, in a village. Uh, and so we, we had a boat and we were um, driving around. And it was also, it's also been really uh, interesting and transformational as an educator to think about how we have to teach in different ways depending on the, the cultural heritage and context and, and histories and experiences of other people. So how do you translate uh, the metaphors on which a desktop files, folders, trash can, that's it's all in the computer based on the corporate office. And if somebody has not had that experience in an office, how does it really make sense? And what is the best way for them to also be able to learn those tools um, and, and you know, various technologies and, and ways of connecting? And um, finally, on the temporal, this was uh, Romelia's a day in her life. And it, it was really confronting for us to, to see in this workshop that the students ran around time valuation that there was not a single moment where Romelia had a, a, a rest, leisure, choice, none of that, right? It's all packed with needs and addressing needs. Um, so to end, you wanna go back to cultural heritage, which is really you know, the, the basis of this whole uh, talk um, and really ask and, and challenge ourselves, how might we share the responsibility of cultural preservation? How can we together, not just put the pressure on those who are marginalized to make sure that their craft and their, the gorgeous uh, artisan work that they do doesn't, doesn't fade away, but that they may also be able to have access to this crossing of borders, uh, stamps on passports, et cetera, that many of us have had the privilege uh, and, and really in many ways luxury uh, to live through. Thank you so much. Uh, and I look forward to the conversation. Fantastic, Cynthia, thank you so much. Um, you showed Lake Atitlan. It's one of my favorite places in the whole world. Uh, I had the privilege of being there last year in December and uh, it was fantastic. Uh, memories of traveling. So uh, another place where I would love to travel is Puerto Rico. Um, our next and final speaker, Maria de Mater O'Neill is a doctor of design practice based in Puerto Rico. Her work at Rubber Band Design Studio uses participatory and community design methodologies from making laws accessible, giving design thinking and co-design workshops to coffee farmers to recently working with a climate organization for its transformation. Welcome, Dr. Maddie. And uh, actually I'm going to play Mary's uh, video um, well, she appears on the screen, so let me share the screen because in Puerto Rico, the connection might drop, so I want to make sure that we have it. Okay. Hi, I'll be speaking about learning outside of academia, learning in practice, which is how I did my doctorate. I'm a social innovation designer. Um, my methods are participatory and community design. My case study is a nonprofit law firm, Servicios Legales of Puerto Rico. And the user is part of the 44.4 percentage of people on their property as defined by the federal guidelines. Women, head of family, bachelor, they have a bachelor degrees, they're employed and with children. So my story is today is how I learned from my client and from the user. When they first came in, they just want cool graphic design and annual report. But I took the opportunity to do design-led research, which is mostly what I do when we for our clients in Robert Band. 
So I propose storytelling as a way to learn about the lawyers and about their clients. They came back the following year requesting branding. What you see here is the logo that used to be the website and it's just a sample of applications. This is the work that we did, new logo, new branding. We did wayfinding. We're still doing it, right, actually. And uh, what you see on the bottom to the left, those icons, is part of the vocabulary that we use. The story behind this, also doing design-led research, I spoke with lawyers, and lawyers wanted Servicios Legales to be very modern. But I also sat with, the, with their clients on the lobby, in the wait, waiting rooms, and asked them, and they wanted the lawyers to be very formal. So this is the articulation of those results. I was very concerned about the rebranding because during this process, Servicio Les Gales was having a union problem. But since this was done with consultation and in some part co-creation, it just was taken very well. The following year, they came back. We did another annual report, but this time more interactive. And what you see mostly here is the data visualization. We wanted to promote numbers, so it will be a way of, of bringing transparency since it's a nonprofit. And what you see on the right, the last two uh, uh, toolkits, they are meant to teach the user about law terms and procedures. And also, it was a way for lawyers to be more user-friendly. This material, these terms are very complicated. So we had to intervene the copy. So it was using, the strategy was using UX practice, pocket of information, icon base, and what very short uh, uh, copy so people understand very quickly. So when I'm very uh, doing in, in the ideation, like in the, the part of design thinking, when I do strategy, this is what I do. I step out of the computer. I, I'm like a child. I'm on the floor with cutouts and sharpies, and I put everything together, what is going to happen with the client's projects. But here it is more <laughs> orderly, as you want me to. And this model is used by Margaret Higgins from Lobite Design. On the top, the communication design, is the visual communication with all the branding that we did. As you see on the right, is the A-B testing. I always consult the, the user and show them which brochure is best for you to understand the procedures and the steps you have to take on the case. And then we start doing product design, which are the toolkits that I was talking about. And recently, we did uh, a service design research which to improve the user experience. So we are right there on the dot line. One, we want to move the organization for best practice for supporting lawyers and do system design, which is in complex systems to improve service and strengthen their value. So lesson learned is to reflect via design. I learned to love slow cooking, to wait patiently, and I think my clients learn that design can be a social tool. And the users, they learn about their law and their rights. So I wanted to share a quote from the communication officer from Servicios Legales. It has been an enriching journey for the organization to have been working with Robert Van. Marimate has slowly taken us into a different design experience. It has helped the organization to have rejuvenate brand but more important has made us conscious of the user perspective and needs when developing materials and experience. So there you go, learning outside of academia. Thank you. That was a great presentation, Mari. Um, okay. So now we are going full on with everyone. Um, so there's two ways of asking questions. You have the hashtag hht.edu. I saw that the Slido still works. So if you have used that for asking the next question, um, I'm sure like, you know, the co-hosts are going to be able to pop it up. And then uh, we are also using the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. So please use that as well. 
Um, we're going to start uh, with a couple of questions that I have for um, the speakers. So, uh, Julio, if you can put us all in view mode, that would be great. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so don't forget uh, for all the attendees, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom. So this was a great presentation and uh, so much and so little time. So I'm trying to get just a sense of, uh, you know, perspectives. You don't have, all of you have to answer everything, just like whoever wants to uh, pick this question, uh, so we, we get started. So what have been the major challenges or obstacles you encountered as a Latin or Hispanic educator in your academic experience? And what can we learn from those uncomfortable moments? Um, can I start? <laughs> well, um, I just wanna start, um, this is a reflection on my teaching because I, I taught in Mexico, I taught it, um, and I have taught here in the United States. And it's twofold. It has to do with the teacher and it also has to do with the culture of the students. Um, so the challenge I have faced here also is twofold. I have taught in the Midwest and now I'm teaching here in San Francisco and I can sense and I can feel, you know, how things are different. I guess, you know, in my case, language for sure, because I'm a non-native speaker, but also like this idea that like, con todo, con todo, you know, like the passion and like, let's, let's engage and like find, you know, like this vividness and, you know, and like doing something that is going, you know, like, yeah, let's, let's change the future. I think like communicating that to students, especially now that they're like, you know, all the time on the screen and trying to access to information in one second and you know and like having everything perfect just by tapping on some buttons i think when the two factors you know like combine you know like this like you know like um you know like the mexican way that you know we can do it we need to find a way to do it to deal with like a small or few resources or no resources but we can figure it out in combination to okay, teach me what's A, B, C, and D, and I'll do it. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a clash, it's a clash. So I think that will be one of the biggest challenges I have faced that, you know, I need to learn how to, um, you know, like instill, you know, like that passion and that idea that, you know, we can work it out. And, you know, it's not that, you know, that design is something about like, you know, like doing and learning by doing. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's a very big challenge. Anyone else want to cover that? I don't know that um, I consider it a big challenge, but just like Omar teaching in different uh, cities or states, like Connecticut is very different than Florida um, or even Miami. Uh, so I still have a diverse group of students in here, uh, but I feel like the Miami students were more like, let's do this. Let's tackle these problems. Let's make this world. Let's, let's design. Let's get our name out there. And then here I have to like push them a little bit too. Um, I am also the only Latin faculty in my department. Uh, so I'm sure um, that is playing into the park and they're sort of like testing the waters with me. And, and I just have to like stay firm and, and try to motivate them as much as I can. Uh, but I, I am so ready to be back in the classroom full time. <laughs> I see many nodding, nodding heads, so I'm going to leave it a little bit longer. Anyone else wants to chip in with your experience and obstacles and what we learn from them? I would like to the perspective of Puerto Rico because I, I, my experience in the state is very different in, in the island. Son dos realidades distintas, ¿no? Eh, I will tell you that the challenge that we have here is the institution, mostly not so much the, the faculty or other teachers and colleagues and students, but the institution. And how education has become a commodity. 
And here with the COVID situation, that's more clear. I'm sure it happens also in many places in around the world. Uh, who has access to that kind of education and who has access to technology in able to, sorry, to continue uh, assessing uh, knowledge. So th I think that's the challenge for me now in terms of, um, of what you're proposing instead of, of, of a question of being Hispanic or Latino. I will say that, that obviously our countries, uh, or Puerto Rico or, or uh, South American countries, or what they call the global south, um, we do suffer for lack of, uh, of resources. And so the situation with COVID and the way the institution handles it, it puts a lot of pressures on us as educators. And I'm sure it happens in many places in the state, especially if we have to put the equipment, our software, our data, no one is backing off on that. So that's, that's my, that's, that's my perspective from this, from this island. Thank you, Mari. Anyone else? I, so I'm, I'm pretty new to teaching, but I think I, I, there are challenges and, but instead of focusing on the challenges, I actually think being his, being Hispanic, being Latin makes me a better educator in some ways, because I understanding two languages allows me to connect with students that are coming from different cultures to whether or not those are Latin cultures. I feel like I have a bit of a, a broader perception of, of the world and of like family and how difficult it is to be far away from home. Um, and at a school like MICA that has a, a large international student population, I feel like being Hispanic is my superpower in a way, even though many of the students there are not Hispanic, which I would say is maybe a challenge. I, I really, I wish I had more Latin students so that I could share my work and really connect with them. And it's such a joy when I do have Latin students and I'm able to provide that extra bit of feedback or that cultural uh, connection. But um, yeah, I think instead of a challenge, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good thing. Um, I, we need more of us. Totally agree with that. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, and I share the experience with Melanie. I used to teach in Connecticut and I was the only Latina. So I, I understand that. So I'll move up to the next question. What do you do to inspire students to learn about multiple cultures, not necessarily just your own? And uh, it's kind of like a two, two sided question. So that, and then as educators, we are also lifelong le learners. Uh, what can culture teach you that a classroom can't? Can I can I go first? Sure, you go. It's very fast. Este, recently, I've been using a colleague, a friend of mine, Leslie and Noel, critical alphabet card, and it forces students to ask. How your design, your design solution will change if you will be designing uh, for black people or for gay people or non-binary people. How that design will change. Um, what is your privilege? Uh, uh, do, do, does your design um, support oppression? So it, uh, when students are presented with those questions and trying to apply it to the work, it becomes very difficult, the conversation in the classroom, it's, uh, because they have to face who they are and, and the dark side sometimes that they're unexpected. And, and there's no right answers instead of, the, of, of, of seeing the other. So that, that's what I use. So I recommend the alphabet card from Leslie and Noel. Thank you. Matias? Yeah, I was gonna say that here in Chile, one, one of the different one of the difference uh, when when we see the design programs with uh, compared to the U.S., I've seen that the U.S. programs they last four years and, and the students graduate with a senior exhibition. I don't know if that's common for all universities, but it's what I saw at Purdue, right? And in Chile, it's five years, but the last the fifth year, it's it's a project mostly a project. They have to uh, create a project from, from scratch and, and graduate by presenting and defending that project. So it's mostly like a graduate exhibition, I mean like a graduate thesis. And, and, and many of these projects within our school, 
they engage, they engage or students choose to engage in the in a research about the indigenous cultures in our territory. So there's many of them, right? And they have they have their crafts, their 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 own beliefs, uh, their own society or hierarchy system, even though they all fit within the Chilean government, right? But they do research that, so th we encourage that a lot. It is hard for them to do it before because you have to access to those people and it's not an easy task because you have to spend time with them. It's not like you can bring them to the university. So within that year, they usually they travel to that place, they interview them, they learn their craft, and then they adapt or they do some uh, modification, or they, they, they interpret that craft and redo it in some other way. So in that matter, in Chile, it happens a lot that students will uh, voluntarily go and research about um, indigenous cultures and their crafts and th their designs, and then they will rebuild out of that. Um, in in previous years, I mean, when when you're when they're freshmen or or juniors, you do them do similar research, brief research, but through museum, through catalogs, and through theses that some some older students have done, but. Yeah, it's something that they go voluntarily uh, a lot because it's something that all teachers, I think, we can see it here. Uh, we're all concerned of keeping those uh, heritage alive. So it's part of the conversation always. It's part of the social sustainability of our, of our country. And, and it's also part of, part of our identity. So it's, it's very good. And, 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 and that also answers the question that one of our difficulties is that you can't find formal design books about those uh, indigenous cultures. But as I was saying, this thesis that the students uh, do within a year, it's a very good material, at least to start from. And then you can go and do your own research. Thank you. Thank you, Matias. This is like a, a follow up question that I had about like resources and tools. Um, so I see in the Q&A a question um, how do you all negoti negotiate the visual and aesthetic needs of a project with the more meta design principles that you are developing? Do they ever conflict? And I wonder if uh, Cynthia- well, I'll jump in. Would love to answer that. Yeah, thank you, Ariana. Um, I think I would perhaps challenge um, that projects need particular aesthetics. Uh, and the, you know, the example that comes to mind is in one of our uh, field work projects, working with a group of artisans who said that they would love it if the students designed a logo for them. And so students came up with variations and we put it out on our blog and, and got votes from our own, our own um, you know, classmates and faculty, our own uh, university community, let's say. Um, and then we, we brought it to the artisans who were, let's say, the clients for this particular project. And they, they, their, their preference was the one that we thought was the, I guess, less, uh, less professionally designed logo. And they had very particular um, reasons why they preferred that one. And it was really because the way that the visuals and the colors were being used, uh, they felt uh, really was an homage to the complexity of the weaving technique that that particular community of weavers uses. Uh, in um, in Guatemala. And so the question there would be, you know, back to you, like, how do we privilege aesthetics over um, across those those co cultural boundaries, right? Um, and so it's the, the client's aesthetics, the designer's aesthetics. And then, of course, you know, what is the what is the purpose of the of the work that we're doing? Is the purpose really to have a, a logo or is the purpose uh, for this artisan group, perhaps, to try to become a little bit more entrepreneurial with, with how they were functioning in the world. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, there's another question, uh, is what are some good ways to get to know about, to get to know about someone's culture back, cultural background? I care about learning new things. I love all that you can discover, but I don't like being a bit of a fathead. <laughs> I read the whole thing. <laughs> so who could, who could uh, answer that? Uh, so I can go. Um, in Jordan, it's not easy. Uh, I try, I get very uh, involved in my students. So I'm very engaging in my classrooms and I talk to them a lot. 
and I do a lot of one-on-ones and my classrooms tend to be a lot more like studio um, conversation spaces than just design work. Uh, of course, yes, I want them to design because I want to see that they're learning and doing the work, but they can also do that at home because in the classroom, I can get to know them. I can get to know their background, a little bit where they're from. And once they get comfortable with me, then they start being a little bit less shy and they can start speaking up. Um, and I, I spend a lot of time outside of the classroom as well. Like I don't mind staying, um, and staying over, but obviously that's part of being the full-time professor, uh, cause it is our time. Uh, and then just doing those little projects every now and then where I can put them and interview other people. Uh, and usually when I do my UA, UI uh, classes and they have to do apps, they must do research outside of their comfort zone and outside of their community. So they can actually step out and do the research because if they're going to create something within their group, they don't really have to understand much of it because they're already involved with it, right? It's already ingrained in their community or in their day to day. And they also need to apply this when they're out in the job market and actually doing jobs. If I may. Um, yes, go uh, ahead. Yeah. yeah um, I work with different students and um, from different backgrounds. And I am very sensitive to people who are from another, another society. I mean, me being a, a foreigner who comes to this country at age 34. So I always encourage students to speak up. When I have, for instance, some Asian students and I culturally, some of them are quite shy. You know, I talk to them directly and I say things like, I have been in your shoes in front of everybody and I have been shy to talk because people look at you and then go like this, like dogs when they look at you like this. And I'm thinking, just do it. If you don't ask, then you are missing out. If people do react that, that, that way, you are able to speak two languages. You should be proud of what you do. And that has worked for me. And um, my best students happen to be international. I have to say it's not, I don't want to say that my American students are not, but it's a different mindset because they have come here and they're trying to take advantage of every single opportunity. So I teach reporting in Spanish, for instance, and my course has produced the most amount of stories published in the journalism program. Or um, I, I take students in travel writing to Peru three times. Well, I do all those things in terms of including, because since I, I am a Fulbrighter and I believe in the Fulbright mission, I always try to give that not only to, to Latinos, but to any person who is a newcomer. I was gonna say something similar. I was uh, when I was at Purdue, I had a teacher who was American, um, Asian American. He was born in Hawaii, and, and he was very picky with asking people from different cultural backgrounds things about themselves. And and and, and you would see his. He, there were many students that hated that, and many who loved it. Like he, there was no middle ground with him. Many people loved him, many people hated him. Because of that, they thought he was like very uh, disrespectful by asking these many things. But I would say, or, or, or I mean, as a student, I was very happy with him asking me things about Chile and my her heritage, my culture and stuff. And, but I think what, what worked sometimes for other people as well was that whatever he asked wasn't just because for asking. So sometimes he was trying to drive the conversation towards a design process or towards a design product or to motivate you to engage your own culture towards a design. So that worked a little better for some people because they felt like they were being forced to think about themselves in, 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 in terms of take that to action, not just because of the teacher's curiosity. So I would say maybe if you have that idea in which you can drive somebody to use that heritage, towards some design project or some design results, it will be a good approach because they will feel like you're trying to take the best out of that and not just satisfy your own curiosity, I guess. Thank you, Matias, for that. 
Um, so I have a great question. I don't want to miss here. Like, oh, we are we are starting to receiving questions uh, to get a little bit uh, for the Q and A to kick in. Um, so, how do you do the work of the colonizing the colon? Can pronounce that word. The colonizing through design in Latinx communities that aren't aware of oppressive conditions or aren't interested in disrupting the oppressive status quo. And who would like to take that question? Okay. I would like to take that one. Um, <laughs> okay. Most of the, the work that I do in classroom is project based, and I move my students to work with other communities. And sometimes they don't know the other community personally. This is before COVID. So uh, they work with children in public schools, even in Brooklyn or in another part, other part of the town. So this colonization brings question of, of who is bringing the information, who has the power of defining, and who is the, the one who is receiving. So working with co-creation, with users that you don't have contact physically, those, and the responsibility of receiving and uh, putting it back, uh, having that kind of communication makes the conversation with the student uh, more aware of the situation of discolonization. Mind you, uh, Puerto Rico is the U.S. territory. Uh, th there is no discolonization. We are a colony. So it's everyday living for us. Pero Puerto Rico has many Puerto Ricos. Uh, so, so that's the way I, I handle about the question of power and who has the power. Eso. Anyone else would like to add to Mary? Yeah, I'll jump in. I, I, I love this idea, uh, Mari, about the, you know, it's, it's the everyday life. Um, so I, I think, how do you do the work? You do the work that you want to do, right? You, you model, uh, you know, Ariana, to your question, um, you, you shed light on, on what you think are the oppressive conditions. You, um, you, intention, you are intentional about the sources from which you're reading, the examples that you're showing the students, the work that you're having them do, so that you don't, you don't need to tell them, you don't need to use the words that you're using in your question. You can essentially, maybe at the end of the semester, you, you tell them um, the, the kind of pedagogical framing that, with which you, you approached your particular course. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I see this question uh, from Mauricio, and maybe this is the way to wrap it up. Like, I know the, there will be questions. I have more questions now, but, you know, we have a short time. So what do you see as the future of design that takes our Latin influence and roots to be better represented in a broader design, not just for Latin audience? Well, we need to have the interest of the community in general. So if yeah, I am working at an institution and I am working on a project as such, it's like the book that I did, I did it, it was in Spanish, but I wrote it in two languages to include that other part of the, of the audience. The same thing with those posters, you know, they were in both languages. So that's probably a way that you can include because in, in, uh, in the culture here in the US, Anything that is foreign is more work. It's like when you're watching a movie, I say, oh, I have to read subtitles. So I grew up watching everything with subtitles. It's not a big deal, but of course, because that's something that I am used to. And also the media, the media needs to, to, um, to support, to um, give the space to notice, you know, this, this uh, demographic and, and then put it right there. We are there, we are doing this kind of work. Thank you, Elio. Um, I am so delighted and I wish we had, you know, another hour just to uh, delve deeper in all this. But like I, Cynthia suggested, I love your idea, Cynthia. Let's continue the conversation. There's a, the Twitter hashtag and uh, we could, you know, continue this and also uh, AIGA Unidos, right? And um, thank you so much for making this time. I'm going to pass the the torch again to the hosts, uh, Julio and Rachel. Uh, I appreciate all of your times and, you know, have a good night, guys. Thank you.
Thank you. Oh, that was an action-packed conversation. So we hope you guys got a lot of insight, valuable insight. And don't forget one thing. Education is not only about curriculum. It's about empowering the community. It's about bringing people together. That's what AIJ Unidos is all about. So don't forget, hashtag Unidos for everyone. We'll see you next time.